Welcome everybody. Tonight is the 11th of October. This is Dallas Personal Robotics Group Robot Builders Night Virtual. If ever there was an organization that needed fewer acronyms and less words, we need a contest of some kind maybe. Uh, I have a new slide for tonight. Uh, realized that we have a number of people who watch the videos online but might not know the ins and outs of the regulars. And uh, just an open invitation. So uh, if you've seen the videos and you find it interesting, now, these meetings are free to attend. Everyone's welcome. EPRJ uh, membership is not required. Uh, but of course, uh, especially for locals, we, the annual membership fees do help cover some of the costs that we have. Um, upcoming calendar. So nothing's really changed on the left. Uh, so I'll just leave that up if someone wants a screenshot. But uh, it's about, what is it, four weeks? November 12th, we have our Robo Columbus contest. Uh, we hold a location in Dallas and remotely if anybody wants to join in. And uh, then we have a handful of other uh, backlog ideas for our monthly meetings. Uh, any other updates anyone would like to add? Okay, so with that, uh, I would say we should just dive right in. We have our usual quorum. So let's dive right in and the, for the queue tonight. Uh, we'll go around the table. We have uh, Michael, and then Ray, and then Doug, and then a kind of free for all. So, uh, Michael, how's it been going? Claw machine on mute. He's on mute. Okay, so the here. down link from the ground station isn't working. Maybe you need to go back to the space station in the backyard. Okay. Microphone, audio issues. Still no audio there, guy. You know, I've read a lot about video editing, and they say the most important part of video is actually the audio. Maybe this is proving a point. Hello. Hey. Uh, there you go. All right. How's it? That happened the other day, too. I don't know why it keeps turning itself off. Anyway, you remember I was talking about trying to get one of these cheap robots to run a straight line, and I was going to draw, draw the, uh, not draw. I was going to make the sketch myself, right? The, yeah. Huh. So, as a challenge to write it myself, instead of instead of just using, well, anyway, I started doing that. And uh, let me unplug this thing. Um, also, I told you I was. I didn't like these wheels, so I was trying to find some wheels that fit these motors. Well, DF DF Robot does have them, like we talked about last week, but they wanted twenty five dollars shipping to ship huh. these little bit of wheels. I'm like, that's outrageous. Anyway, I found these on Adafruit, and they fit these motors. So they're two dollars a piece, two dollars fifty cents a piece. Adafruit, because I kind of had them hot shotted in here, I paid thirteen dollars for shipping. And I bought six of them, and but you can get the like the you know the cheap five dollar shipping if you want to wait a, a week. But anyway, I got I got the encoders running on this to where I can see the encoders uh, uh, tick. And um, but here's what I ran into a problem today. I messed with it all day long. I could not get the PWM to run on one of these motors. I changed out the Arduino, I changed out the motor drive, and I, I checked the continuity in the wire, and it come to find out that I'm using that timer one, have y'all heard of that uh, add-on? Timer one for the interrupts? Well, I'm using timer one, and, and PWM on pin nine and 10 don't work when you have that loaded. Has anybody ever run across that issue? So I can see Carl has seen that. So anyway, I'm scratching my head and, and uh, at least I didn't get frustrated because I know there's always an answer. Used to I get frustrated at this stuff. So I just wanted to share that I found some wheels and that I've got I haven't got it the I haven't got the PWM synchronized to the ticks on the on the uh, on the uh, encoders yet, but I got the encoders counting. And uh, and I figured out a problem that after I, I messed around, messed around, I started changing pins around and 
after changing Arduino boards and everything, and it started working on one of the pins. So I decided, to, after all that, that's when I decided to Google it and find out that this isn't an isolated case. So anyway, just let your heads up on that. Also, I want to prove that this thing runs. Oh. Okay, you see those those wheels turning? That should be some kind of star, right? I should get a star for that. Some kind of star. Is that not <laughs> where's where's <laughs> Doug? Put it on the floor, and you get a gold star. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's all it takes. Let it let it run off the cord. <laughs> it's right off my my bench. My bench. Well, I can I can hook it up to the battery pack, but uh, I've got it on my bench power supply. Let's I test it. Do what does it do if you put it on your keyboard and let it roll on there? <laughs> I can do it. Let's see. I just plug it in and and uh, uh, let's put in the air is a helium star. Huh? I like it. Let's see here. Gold star! Gold star! <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my next challenge is to get it to go in a straight line. I know I'm there. I know I can get it done. And I'm going to do it without a... Well, if I looked up all that PID stuff, and I'm just not smart enough for all that PID controller stuff. I'm just... Uh, I'm a dummy when it comes to that stuff. So that gets too complicated. So I figure I can just do it with... You know, it's a little bit simpler. So hey, Michael. Anyway. You, you'll have to use something. And if you, use, I mean, realistically, unless you just said it, you have to have some sort of PID control. It doesn't have to be a PID. It can can I just use PID? Yeah, that's all you have to do. Well, I yeah. can do PID. I know I can. Yeah, I mean, just all you have to do is say, okay, here's my input. Multiply it by this number. That's what I want. And that's all you have to do. I think I can handle that one. So. Yeah. Anyway, so that way I have my, my my own code that I wrote that runs in a straight line. And as I, my objective with that was to really, I just want to understand what's going on. So I got that. But anyway, I'm done. That's all I got for tonight. That's pretty good. Has well, anybody that's heard of that? Do, the, huh? do, the, do those wheels have the, uh, rubber? Yes. Yeah, they got a rubber, rubber, uh, yeah, see that? Rubber tire. Yeah. Rubber tire, you put it, you stretch over that. And they got little grips on them. So, and what's nice is they fit these cheap, these cheap, uh, motors. So, anyway, I got that going. I've used wheels like that before. Maybe not the same ones, but with the rubber tires, those will do you well. Yeah, and uh, the thing about it is they fit the hubs. That it, it's hard to find that it, it's hard to find good tires that fit these cheap motor shafts, you know, with the two flats on them. Yep. Yeah, they look like the Pololu uh, tires. I mean, they have, they have a good selection. I've used those as well. So they're Adafruit. So I, you know, you can't go wrong all times with Adafruit either. So. Yeah. The Polo Lou won't cheap fit those cheap motors. You have to have an adapter. I've got so, some of the Polo Lou's right here, two different kinds. Yeah. They just don't fit. Yeah. They're better for the 20 millimeter and micro millimeter and all of those other, all of the motors they carry. But I'm working actually, my, my I'm trying to, I'm going to work for the five, for the, uh, the, the five can or six can for next year, that's going to be my, my goal. Okay. Sounds for, so right. if I get, it running, I get it running a straight line, I can use that as my, you know, as my code for that. And then, then I'll just build on that. So that's my plan. Very nice. Well, cool. Okay. Good update. Leading with a gold star or on a good path here then. So Ray, I think you're next in queue and then Doug. Sure. <clears throat> anyway, 
Um, the little color sensor from Adafruit is, I'm finding out, not really the ultimate sensor. It's kind of disappointing. It's the ultimate sensor in the summertime when your grass is green and the only thing that's orange out there is the cone. It'll find it really well up to 60 feet. But now in the in the fall where the grass is kind of brownish, grayish, you know, orangish, it barely works at all. <laughs> Very disappointing. So I had to go to um uh I've been using the OpenMV H7 and you know made some polarizers. Um, you know, just a 3D printed ring that holds a cutout circle of polarizer, yeah. 3D glass material from, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, the material and the lenses in 3D glasses, basically. Oh, okay. Um, well, anyway. Did cut, how did you cut it around, Ray? Did you use your scissors or did you? Yeah, use... yeah. Just, yeah, just a pair of scissors. It works pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And it, I actually made this to make it square so you know which way it's polarized. Um, well, I can kind of tell just by looking at the image. I suppose you know? so, yeah. Yeah, so it works out. Um, I also grabbed a, have an old uh, Nikon SLR and grabbed a circular po polarizer off of it just to see if mm. it might work. But um, it does darken it, but it doesn't work as well. Um, from OpenMV H7, you could buy a polarizer. And I just realized that I did have one. I was thinking, you know, I was looking at their website and it's like, oh, ah, you can get a polarizer from them. And I, and I said, oh, I, I already have one of those. It was actually in another lens setup that I kind of forgot about, but uh, um, I'm going to try that and see if it works any better. Um, I'm really thinking that, you know, you look at, how the um, how the pixie cam is set up it is kind of like it seems like the most optimized blob detector you know uh, that you could ever try to use you know um, I'm kind of hoping that the the camera brightness adjustment will work in you know various you know bright sunlight conditions um, you know if I if I have to stick a polarizer on the front of it that's okay but um, I thought maybe, I, I forget how many signatures you can do. I think it's like 15 or something. I was thinking it's of- eight, like, eight, I think. Oh, it's only eight? Oh, I thought it was more than that. I think anyway, how many ever there are, I thought, okay, I'm gonna scale this from, you know, not so Orangey bright, orange very bright to, Oh yeah, What's okay. That? Oh yeah, I was, you can also use a couple of them to get your or different oranges too. You know, oh like, yeah, yeah. You don't have well, to the, get it right on, but it, it is tricky to set up. Yeah, I can't think of anything to, better. Yeah, at this point, it's um, um, you know that's what Scott's going to be using the Pixie Cam. Yeah, he, he said he was going to be using the Pixie too, which I don't know that the adjustments on the well, okay, maybe with the lenses, there might be. A oh, difference. I'll be quite honest. I don't. If he really has a Pixie too. And he doesn't have the Pixie Two Plus. Uh, I think it. I think he's stepping back. And I also don't like the Pixie Mon. Yeah. The Pixie Mon in the Pixie Two is more uh, simplified for the user. So you you have even less that you can adjust than oh, really? the original yeah. Pixie One Pixie Mon. Yeah. Yeah, I have the Pixie one, and so I'm using the mm -hmm. Pixie Mon that goes along with that one. So yeah. it still has the same adjustments that it, that I, you know, that I'm used to seeing. You're I don't think it's hate. Hate. Yeah. What's that? The ones you used to know and hate. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's the approach I'm going to take. It's getting a little late in the game to keep making changes, but I don't think that that other color sensor is going to work. So. Uh, not unless Steve watered his lawn and it's lush and green, but I doubt it. You know, it's probably burnt out and looks like everybody else's lawn. Yeah. So, well, if I remember right, 
he's he's kind of sparse, but he has a lot of clumps. Clumps. It, yeah, of grass. Know, like yeah, like there's areas that don't have grass, and then there's a clump. But the clump is because it has grass on it, isn't as eroded as the areas that don't have grass. So you end oh. up with a clump. You know, so when you're going down there, you can you hit hit a clump. So it's it can be challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, I even took apart, it was an old security camera. I thought it had, uh, you know, it had a little stepper motor kind of on the side of the lens and it had, it had two levers on it. And it turns out, well, I thought the, the stepper motor was driving like uh, an autofocus or something. Turns out it's, um, it was an iris basically. Um, and that the, the focus and the zoom, the, the, well, that's what the two other levers were for, so focus and zoom. But, um, and I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to just, you know, use some electrical tape, basically, and tape this lens to the front of a pixie cam. Uh, or the, actually, I did it on the open, open MV, but the, the focal distance isn't right. You can't get, it won't focus when it's adjusted all the way down. It's, you know, eh, I don't know, maybe 12 millimeters too much barrel that that pushes it apart it, you know where it would be um or where it was set up to focus and it just you know i can't it, it won't fit into the barrel so i can't use it but um you know I, and then I, I looked for cameras with you know irises on them and i couldn't seem to find anything um I thought, you know, okay, well, maybe the Pixie camera, the the nicer one has it or something like that, but doesn't seem to be out there. So, but, you know, that's, that's one method of reducing the amount of light is to, you know, use an iris and just like SLRs, you know, you, you set the aperture and then the, you know, the uh, depth of field, you know, that kind of thing or with the aperture, but Anyway, you know, so one, qu one, one question is, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to encourage you to go down that that hole, but if you wanted to go down that hole, uh, you could, uh, you could probably uh, 3D print one piece with adjusted focus and just take the rest of the mechanism and stick it on the 3D piece that you'd already, otherwise replace the back end of it. I mean that. Like I say, I'm not encouraging you to go down that rabbit hole. I'm just saying that yeah, it, there's probably a way to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Oh, in other words, use the iris out of the other camera. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually, it's actually kind of a, a thin slit. It's got a little stepper on the back of it. Mm. And it actually pulls two pieces together and kind of closes off uh, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I see. an area. But um. Yeah, I don't know if it's, you know, time's a wasting. I got other things to, to work out. So the uh, yeah. Yeah, same old problem, you know, there's not really a camera that works that well over such a wide range of light, you know. Yeah. It's kind of like the uh, Perot Museum again, you know, you got this. Uh, this horrible bright light coming in, reflecting off a polished floor that's, yeah, you know. Yeah. So. Well, I promise I will not wear one of my t-shirts again like that to cause you problems. Okay. okay. I, I promise that. We'd appreciate that, Jerome. Now you're being nice. <laughs> For a fee, he won't wear his, uh, his orange t-shirt. <laughs> anyway, so that's what I've been working on. That's that's about it. The other parts of the robot seem to work pretty good. Um, but, you know, if you can't find a cone. Well, remember, you get your mug after one point. So you get down there, you got your mug. Yep. Yeah. So. Hopefully it's downhill to the first cone. I'm, I'm kind of counting on that. <laughs> you are. <laughs> well, sounds like Carl might be running into some of the problems I'm running into, but 
Anyway, so, you know, last week I thought, I've been testing all the individual units, got them all individually working. You know, I got my robot together pretty good about it. You know, I'm really rocking. So I said, well, there's just a few little things I wanted to do. So I'll, I'll tell you what I did. You know, first I wanted to reduce the noise as much as I could. You might want to pin me here. So on my robot, I don't know if you can see it here. Let me see if I, I might have to do something here. Let me. Yeah. All right. So you see the motor in there? Can you see the motor? I like the lighting underneath. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, if you. I don't know if I can. Ha yeah, this is the yeah, old case of the motor. <laughs> well, right here. If I can find a pencil. It's a little Blair Witch right. Project eBay. Yeah. <laughs> I've put in three three capacitors on the motor to help cut down on the on the interference. So that was one improvement I went ahead and made. Did it help? And, uh, you know, I don't know if I can really quantitate quanti quantify that because I wasn't really having a lot of problem with the noise. It's got to be better, but how much better, I don't know. Uh, the second thing is I went to Hobby King and actually bought stabilization bars for this model, uh, which is probably the last part they have in stock. So it was probably a good thing to do. Uh, and here's where I ran into the next problem. And this is after I've done some adjustments. So you're you're looking at the yeah you're looking at it. Let's see if I can get it there. Okay. Now when I hit it and it goes down and it pops up, but you know you see there's there's plenty of room there that's not being used. Okay. And what I need is some stiffer springs. Well, you know I went to Hobby Town and asked if they had any springs that I could you know look at. Basically, they blew me off. So I've never gone in there and actually got anything that worked. So anyway, the one thing just so happened, serendipitously, I had some shocks. Shocks. Did you look at Elliot? LX. I don't know who they are. Elliot's hardware. Oh, yes, I did, and I and I uh, found one spring. That was a was a contender. One spring, not two springs, not four springs, one spring. So, and I called around to the other Elliots and Zippo springs. So I think I, they must have been the most popular bin. But since I had one, I took a picture of the bin, which gave me some of the dimensions. And I can, for way more than I wanted to spend, I get 20 of them from uh, Granger's. Uh, so um, that's not exactly the same thing, but they're they're better. And I'll probably, it's only 22 bucks, so I'll probably go ahead and do it. I had to, you see this, you can see the clue just started. This bumper, if you remember, was down lower. Well, it's up high now because now I can move it back to reduce the weight on the front. All right, so I, that was one thing I had to do. Uh, I was telling you about these news. I happen to have some shocks that are slightly better. And uh, so like the other one might have, might support two and a half pounds. And this guy supports probably three and a half, four pounds maybe. So. I only have them on the front right now. I might put some on the back. Uh, I have uh, St. Augustine grass that's pretty thick. So it's like the torture test. And it can it can handle it, but every once in a while it, it bogs down. So that's something that I've got to, to um, still play with a little bit. Hey, and Doug, 
Have you tried uh, putting spacers on the springs to kind of compress them? Well, on mine, they actually have a ring that you can, a screwed in ring that you can bring down. And I brought it all the way down to the bottom. Okay. Yeah, Ted, I, yeah, they're, they're just not quite there. Then I guess the other thing, that I, I don't know if you can see this right here is it turned out with when I was doing doing this, it turned out that I could put a could put a a, a wixel on this board. So I went ahead and did it. So I should be able to do some teleop, which is really nice. You know, I if I had more time, I'd probably do something like Ray did. Uh, the wixels are supposed to be good up to about 50 feet. So the thing I've been working, so I, I actually got st all of that aside. I actually got started on the software for this version. And uh, let me plug this in now. Give me a second. Oh, there it is. Hey, Doug, have you um, thought about like other, you know, I know Ellis is a true value hardware store. There's a bunch of other true values out there. Um, there's a really good one in Capel. Um, there's one in McKinney, uh, Groom and Sons. Okay. Um, so... This next part. I don't think you heard me. Okay, I can hear you now. Yeah, he oh, had his headphones off. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Sorry. I was just saying there's other true value hardware stores. There's like Groom and Sons and McKinney, and um, there's a pretty good one in Capel. You know, that's Mike. Yeah, I might, have to, I might have to give those a try. Yeah. But, but I actually, the ones from Granger might actually be better. Because they, I might be able to adjust the stiffness not quite as hard as the ones that I saw at the other place. Uh, okay, I don't know. Can you guys see this guy? Can you yeah. see? Can you see that every once in a while there's a thin, thin pulse? Mm-hmm. Okay. And it. All right. This the only thing hooked up that's doing this right now is the GPS. And I believe when I, uh, from, you know, the code before I put the GPS was, you know, perfect square waves. So I'm thinking that my problem is where they initiate the GPX. I think it, somehow that's throwing it off. So I've got a few lines to work out yet to see if I can get my square wave back. Uh, so I've, Played around with the GPS, and this was one of the questions I had, and uh, Kareem's here, so I might, you might have it. All right, so uh, I adjusted my GPS. You know, the default uh, NEMA rate is one hertz. So you get one, one unit, and plus you get a bunch of, of messages that you really can't, it's got redundant information or information you're not going to use. So it turns out that Smartphone recommends a specific library that has two messages and going out to like Audi Pilot and what are those other places, it looks like a refresh rate of uh, five seems to be what they're doing. Though some people are talking about going to 10, but you, you know, you really, this is only one sensor, so you got to kind of watch what, how much you're, how much data you're putting on the on the bus. So anyway, I adjusted, finally figured out how U Center, the world's worst inter interface, they ought to use that for students in college. Okay, here's here's your GPS. I want you to change it to do this, and here's your tool. I mean, its interface is really challenging, but. <laughs> <laughs> once you get agree more, yeah. But once you know, once you Google enough and you figure out, well, that was revision six, and you're in revision nine, and 
but that's what this thing's supposed to kind of look like. And if you go over to this other menu, you see something that looks kind of like that. You know, you, once you get through all of that, I was able to set out, and now I only have those two messages coming, and I did change the rate to five. So that's where I am right now. And like I say, I still have to figure out why I'm getting these thin pulses. Uh, once I get that, then I can move on to putting the next sensor on on the bus and seeing how that's loading things down. So uh, no on the, on the grass except by RC mode, but uh, I had to check and see. I'm using an 85 turn turn brushed motor instead of the original. Um, what do they call it? Brushless. brushless motor, which the problem with the brushless motor is it has plenty of pep, but it goes like a bat out of hell. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like, uh, and there, this one, this one is a kind of a Dave Anderson, nice leisurely walk behind the robot type of speed. And, uh, I did get, oh, that was the other thing I did. I did get the encoder placed on the the drive shaft like I did in my other model. So, and that seems to be working with no problem. So, I mean, there was a lots of things that have been moved down the road. And then I come to what I got to wonder about these things. Mm -hmm. um, what they're saying, you know, and what I'm thinking is, I only think you get about 10 minutes of runtime with an RC car. that much current? Well, I'm talking with an RC car. And this thing's going to, oh, because of the shock thing, all right, I had to try to cut the weight on the, on the superstructure. So that took my otter box out, so which was how I was going to power the Pi. And I had to put another UBEC in there to handle that. Uh, and I think I remember mentioning to you guys, well, if it ever pulls three amps, it's really on the hairy edge of those UBEX. So we'll see how that, that does. Uh, but, you know, I, I ran it on one of those for hours once, but we just have to see if it's, it's enough. So I'm a little concerned. So I picked up a couple of extra cheapy batteries. So they probably, instead of 10 minutes, you probably get six minutes, but we'll, we'll see. Because I figure you're going to need a battery per run. Uh, Are you serious? You drawing that much current? No, I just well, we'll see. I just think I'm with you, Ray. I would have been said the same thing, but I suspect that it might it it might be more than, or it could be these batteries are just old. We'll find out. Uh, so Don't you have some of those little uh, inline voltage current meter? things uh i have alarms i have oh, i don't okay i don't have the little black box that tells you how how charged your motor your battery is oh no because, i use the uh i found them on amazon i can look it up here in a minute i'm sure but a drock drok makes them and they're like 10 bucks and they uh they just measure voltage and current yeah. and display them in a nicely real time so it's are you not talking about those, those they do do they have this really irritating buzz? No, not at all. Okay. These are, these are LED day. these are LED displays that just show numbers. Oh yeah. They're great. Okay. They're awesome. Tells, I mean, tells you your current current your current current consumption and the and the battery yeah. voltage. You see a drop whenever the motors start really pulling hard. Yeah. Uh, it gives you a good real time sense I mean, of what's going on. At a glance, they tell you what's happening. I just wouldn't. Yeah. Here, I'll. Uh, I guess um, it's similar to those, you know, these little plugins that you can get for USB to tell you how much voltage and yeah. which voltage and current is. Oh, of course, the one I bought three years ago is unavailable, but they look like this. I'll share. But I think there, there's a gazillion. There's got to be a gazillion out there. How much current do you think your your thing is drawing? It sounds like a lot. Uh, well, you remember I'm I'm running slow, 
through tough grass. Okay. Yeah. And I, like I say, I, I can't really, since I haven't quantified it, I really can't tell you how much. And, but you've drained batteries and short runs. Well, and... playing playing around in the yard, I was surprised when the battery drained. You know, it hmm. was it wasn't. You know, I thought I'd be able. I'd be out there for half an hour or so with no problem. I was just playing around, hmm. and it, it wasn't it wasn't a half an hour by any means. So is that like a ten year old battery you were playing with, or what? No, it's a couple <laughs> years. So yeah, couple right. Years. Yeah, still but could be was... a weak battery. I'll, I'll put that search in there, but uh, I mean, okay. there's a gazillion of these out there. Yeah, and, I, I, I wouldn't want to have one with a shunt if I could help it. But you might need that for the at, the, uh, the yeah, amps. I don't I don't think it I don't think it drops much voltage at all. I mean, I've used it in both of mine. I don't I haven't had. Any oh, problem. it's not. Oh, it's not that. It's just that it's another thing to put in line with the battery. Oh, no. It, oh, well, it's but. Um, I mean, this is part of my wiring harness. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's well, probably a super low resistance shunt. So, yeah, because like, uh, yeah, so it's uh, maybe you know, fifty millivolts for twenty yeah. amps, fifty amps. Yeah. What I've got is it's kind of like this, and. It tells you the, it tells you when you got too low. You know you. Yeah, but it, it doesn't give you the. That's I mean, just a battery alarm. That's yeah, for, that's, yeah. that's what Dro it is. Low voltage dropout, so you don't mm -hmm. kill the battery. This is totally different. I put a link in. To... Yeah, good okay. deal. But but these are good if you want to. Uh, you know, you don't have to run around with a um, a DMM dragging in in between in line with your battery. Just get one of these and put it in line, and you're done. And then that's, that's a good idea. No, oh yeah. I'll tell you, you know, you guys put the link in, and I'll I'll look at them because uh, uh, I mean zero to hundred volts, zero to fifty amps. You know, how can you go wrong? Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't waste much battery power, and it tells you, like mm -hmm. at a glance. Let's say you have a crosswire or a, a, a fat finger or something, and it's drawing much much more current than it should. You'll know it right away, but from the display, not by when the battery goes low and beeps the alarm. Yeah, yeah. So far, with the with these batteries, I've found that anything that that when you say wiring is wrong, it's so powerful. It, you 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 got a lot of magic smoke going somewhere. You know quickly. Yeah, you know quickly. So, yeah, but it's okay. I've there's had... a I have a chart that you know that gives me the percent. You know, if you have this voltage or this percent charge, which I'm sure most, you know, all of you guys have seen that. And Dave used to hand them out, little ones that he had, uh, that he made a bunch of. You remember those, Dave? Probably doesn't remember. Yeah. So you know, so if you look at your voltage and it says it's this, then you, you're seventy percent, whatever. So. Oh yeah, the, the little sheets that that said what the batteries were. Yeah, mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah, that was in curve. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, a lot of work was done this week. So a lot of progress. A lot of progress I didn't know I needed to make. <laughs> so uh, now, like I say, I'm just software. Soft. I like I say, I might buy those springs just so that I can have them. But if I can bounce across the yard with what I've got without too much trouble, then I'll pro probably uh, leave that part alone and uh, uh, just doing software. And like I say, I'm hoping to have something on the ground next week. So we'll see. Yeah, I had um, I had two of these. They were, you know, 4,500 milliamp um, mm -hmm. four cell. Mm -hmm. This one oh, is now a three cell because one cell is completely dead. Um, the other three cells it? seem fine. I took it apart to see if I could see like a short somewhere on it, but yeah. I can't see anything. So 
Um, yeah. At night, I stick it in the middle of the tile floor underneath a smoke detector, just in case it decides to you know, do something well, on me. You know. Yeah, I read somewhere where some guy on the on the internet had a way to basically rebuild those. What he does is he takes out take. What he would do is he would make it a three S. He'd open yeah. up the case, pull that one out, put it back together again. Mm. Yeah. Well. Uh, you know, that's another question. How far off is misbalanced? Five millivolts? Um, I think I think it's yeah. all relative, right? It depends on your yeah. circuitry. If no, uh, well, when I charge these guys up, I get one cell will be probably like, like 118, 117, and the other one will be 2.22, you know? So, what what kind of volt uh, or uh, cells are they? They're not lithium. Yeah, they're lithium. Oh, Don't I'm saying I meant difference, difference, not. Oh. So, yeah, and so when you look at the individual cells, they're going to be four point two. I think two two if they're perfect. Mm. Um. So anyway, I was wondering about that. I have uh, never heard any figures for how balanced balance has to be. Yeah. Is anybody I mean, else? I mean, if it one was four point zero and the other was four point two, I'd say you you got a problem. But I don't know if four point one eight is a problem. But I think I think it all depends, uh, Doug, because at the end of the day, the, the how's the problem going to surface? The problem is going to surface by explosion and fire, or one oh, cell yeah. goes so low that you run out of voltage. Yeah. Or, you, or they run out of uh, oomph and they just can't supply enough uh, reading time C to supply the motors. But for the way that we use these, we're so far below 25 C on these things, right? Oh, yeah. In most cases, it seems to me that the biggest risk is that if they're far, if they're really far unbalanced, then what it means is that the goods or the one cell is going to get fully charged, and then the balancer will do what it does, and then it'll stop the pack so that one one cell's at 4.2, the other is 3.9 or 4.0 when it stops. So that means it's not fully charged. You'll have lower capacity, right? And then, yeah. But what it's supposed to do is it takes that 4.2 and drains it to they're both equal, and then it's supposed to try again. So, but 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 the amount that it can balance is not. It's a small current. It's not a big current like it doesn't use this your full charge rate, I believe. So anyway, whatever. End of the day, what's it gonna hurt, right? If it it's gonna hurt your runtime, your chance of smoke and fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I don't know how far imbalanced really is, you know. What and they catch on fire if they're just sitting there in a drawer somewhere. Oh yeah. If there was some issue with it, especially yeah. Yeah, the, if you there's a lot of things you're supposed like if you're you're not going to use this thing for a month or more, you're supposed to take it down to about fifty percent charge. Oh, uh, because I've had one laying around in a in one of these totes for like years that I never used. So, so I, yeah. I, I recommend spraying them in like or one they throw it away. Right. So we look in here, and that's. That's clearly a phone that needs to go to the recycler because it's right. It's <laughs> well, it's, it's bulging. To, yeah, it's yeah, lady. Yeah, that lives most of the time. I try and store them in. In this project I just did for work, um, I had to go grab me a, a, a hobby town, and they managed to sell me one of their branded Spectrum, I think it is, uh, RC batteries and that kind of thing, and they made it real nice for my uh, my VP of code launch because all you got to do is set the charger down plug in the two things i tell them to plug in I even drew them a little picture on the thing to how to plug in plug in the sensor to the battery and uh and it charges it and uh, what they and i explained it to me and i explained it to him these batteries have a built-in discharge so after four days they will discharge them things down to they'll discharge themselves down to about 30 percent 
and then if you're going to use them, the first thing you do is you charge it up. I told them charge it up the day before, and you're good to go. So I mean, they got stuff built in on some of these newer batteries to deal with that. Yeah, well, not not these lithiums. If you charge them, if I charge this lithium to full voltage, it'll stay there for six months. No, 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 no. Uh, no, that's not what I'm saying. They have circuitry inside the battery to discharge themselves. Oh, I got you. Okay, that's actually probably a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, but they also say that if you've discharged it all the way down, you're supposed to put it on the charger as soon as you can for 15 minutes to just kind of like give it a little, little pep, so you don't leave it down there at the bottom. Um. Uh, Anyway, that's uh, the thing I was going to say. One problem that I kind of worked myself into, these are only 2S. And the reason they're only 2S is because the motor and the ECU, ESC, excuse me, that I'm, or whatever it's called, are all 2S. Actually, the motor could probably run 3S, but the ESC is only 2 and it, it would have been better to have 3S. That gives you a lot more energy to mess with. Mm -hmm. So and that might be, the danger. I know, yeah, that's, that's uh, another thing that kind of worked myself into it because of where I am. But we'll see how it goes. I've got a six can question while, we're, while it's on the mind. We change some for a second. Uh, okay. What sensors do y'all use to to read the walls when you want to when you're trying to line it up uh, square with the walls? What sensor are y'all using on the six can? Scott kind uses of, a uh, a lidar rotating lidar lidar mm -hmm. for the walls yeah. or for the cans. No, the walls are. <laughs> Either seven inches or eight inches. I can't remember. So um, what's seven, feet, seven feet, feet by ten feet? Uh, to yeah, like tall. Seven. Oh, tall. Yeah. I think yeah, they're eight eight want to find the middle of the arena. How, how do you well, read? I know this. The most common way is they start off using odometry. Okay. All right, and back in six cans. You should be able to drive through the whole course using odometry, you know, it, with no problem. Okay. But, as long as you don't hit but, but yeah, that's right. If you don't hit anything. And the problem with six can, uh, soccer is that you're most likely going to have to be hit something. And uh, usually if it, if, if it hits, and they're locked, then they get restarted. But if you know, if he, if you, somebody glances, bumped. you get yeah. bumped, and but you dis, you know, you disengage. You just, you're just, you're good to go. And that's one. There's two tricks to what Scott does. He's definitely the fastest robot in the club. When it comes to six can, he, you know, he literally is a probably a minute faster than everybody else. The second thing that he has is that as soon as he gets hit, knocked, or bumped, or even if he isn't getting hit, hit, knocked, bumped, periodically he re-centers himself on the walls. So, I know, but how does he, what sensors does he use? Well, he's using a LiDAR sensor, but that's, LIDAR. but that's probably the hardest way to do it. So... Uh, so what you, sensor do you use for the cans? Pixie uh, cam. He uses a Pixie cam and probably an ultrasonic. He uses a Pixie cam and ultrasonic. So the Pixie cam aims them, and the ultrasonic tells them when to stop. To close the grip. But you, you, you just use yourself, you and Ray just use odometry for the just six can. Well, no, Ray, Ray doesn't even use odometry. He uses another technique, I believe. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I use the, um, the Benewaki, um 
it's another LIDAR. It's not rotating. I have it on a servo, though, so I scan the the goal to try to find the center of the opening. Oh, okay. And I do that each time I try to put a can into the goal. So what kind any, of technology is that that you're using? The, the, it's, it's actually uh, LED. It's not laser, but um, it's the Benawaki. I think B E N E W A K A. I think. A K E. I think. Yeah, I'd have to look it up. Okay. I got one here. Just trying to get you know, an idea so that I can get started. You know, eventually sometime next year, start up. So you see that sensor there above, right, right there. On top that's of the it. servo. Yeah. Yeah, that's it right there. Mm -hmm. That's what he. That's what. What Ray uses? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because you see the the problem. Really, there is some navigation in the, in the problem, but not necessarily as much as you would think. Especially if you. Most of it is. Pointing at a can and going to it. Right. And then pointing to the opening and going to that. Right. So uh, so once you go and you dump your can in the opening, then there is some backing up and turning around. And But at that point, all you want to do is find another can. So you're now going in. So the back up and turn around, and then you go into find a can again. And you drive. So you point at the can and drive to it. And then you... Once you got the can, you turn around to go to the right. You know, sometimes Ray doesn't go to the right one, but you're supposed to go to right to the right end and drive out, drive out again. So, and, and I hits. just use I, I use a switch on the top to uh, hit the goal. I've seen, I've seen that another switch, switch to yeah. know when the can is in the range of the gripper. Okay. So and so, that's. So there's it's a lot of it being on top of a servo. Yeah. And uh, in there is the pixie cam. Okay. Okay. See, that'll give me kind of a, you know, an idea of what to, what to look for and just start Googling all that information and mm -hmm. stuff. And there, there's, uh, I'm really have liked the, the, the new uh, time of flight. Uh, uh, sensors that uh, Polo Loop puts out. They put out a whole slew of them, but there's one particular type that I like, and it essentially is good out to, I think, about, I want to say it's good out to a yard. So you can, you could put those on the side and say, hey, I'm 20, 20, yeah, you know, 20 inches from the wall. So I know. I'm along this wall, uh, and if you have an ultrasonic in front, you might be able to pick up the front wall. So there's a there's a you know there's, I want to say that Dave Anderson has run it successfully just using IR and and sonars, and so has uh, another gentleman. I can't think of his name right now. Who's the gentleman that built the board for the uh, the LIDARs. Mr. LaCroix. Huh? Uh, is it Dave LaCroix? His last name's LaCroix, I'm pretty certain, isn't it? Oh, but anyway, he, he also has successfully done things without, hey, in his case, I don't even think he, he used a camera. So, so there's lots of ways to skin the cat. And I saw a couple several years ago we had a guy do tabletop where in tabletop you have six cans up on the on the table you have to take one can and knock it randomly off the table the other one you have to put into a box that's hanging over at a specific corner then you have to drive a third can back to the starting point and then you have to line the three cans that are left in a line. And the guy did it using 
I don't even think he had an ultrasonic. I think he did it with just infrared sensors, sharp sensors. So, you know, he had a beautiful robot though. It was gorgeous. He came from, he came down from Canada, actually, I believe, to visit us. Well, yeah, this, lot. one of the multi-zone time of flight sensors, it is the VL53L5CX. I think it, I forget how many zones it has, but I'm wanting to experiment with that next to see instead of the Benny walkie, which just has, you know, has to be mounted on a servo and can only make, you know, one measurement. I think I want to say this can make up to 16 different wow. individual who, measurements. Who makes that? It's Spark Fun. Spark Fun. It looks like a Spark Fun board. Yeah. Yeah. It's got the quick connectors on it, but okay. There are several of those that, that start out with the, you know, VL whatever number, but that particular one is. Some, some of those are pretty hard to use though. Oh, well, we would, oh, you think? know, oh, well, yeah, Michael, I just want to say if you're, if you're just getting out, you might want something a little simpler. Uh, there's right. the old fashioned old school would be sharp sensors. They're still available. Um, and then the ones like I was telling you, I'll, I'll look him up and put a link in the thing later on. But it, okay. they're from Polo, but they're real nice because they're real simple to interface. You're just, they're about as hard to interface as uh, uh, ultrasonic. ultrasonic. Yeah, it's about the same as an ultrasonic. You're measuring a pulse width, basically. Okay. So basically, there's a there's all kinds of ways to skin that cat. Basically, yeah. And it's, like I say, some of them are easier than others, for sure. All right, appreciate it. Cool. I think that's the. Uh plan the queue that we had. Uh, so now for the open mic section, uh, Harold's joined. Harold, John, okay. Harold, what you got? I don't know if Harold's hearing you. I think he's switching on oh, there. Place. Yeah, he's showing something. Okay, I'm muted. I'm unmuted now. I'll show you what I got. So on my Twitch stream, I do a bunch of different things, right? Well, there's people that are saying, what can I do with all these channel points? There's people that got 50, 150,000 channel points. And I'm like, well, one, I've been pressed on my saxophone so I can play them a song for 50,000. It's not worth 50,000, but, you know, it's one of the things they can make me do because it's requested. And the other one was when one of my uh, folks got up and asked me, Hey, what if I paid you 50,000 channel points and I get to pick the project you do or we describe it? So, 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 uh, I said, listen, I got stuff laying around and what you're seeing here in the mobile camera is I bought one of these cricket things because I always wanted one. This is a base that I've been hanging around for, I don't know, three or four years from the Hatcher.io folks that we built a bunch of stuff with Arduinos a while ago. Came with, uh, I got a battery pack laying around. I got one of my buck converters here because this thing really only wants five volts, period, in the report. And uh, because I just ordered a bunch of stuff from Adafruit, they sent me one of these Circuit Playground Expresses uh, for free. And uh, so, uh, so, because I was, I did my, uh, my Blue Clear briefcase, which I'll post up on the thing for the uh, code launch. And so he goes, I go, well, you know, I got all these stuff laying around. How about for a stream? It ended up being a stream and a half. We put this thing together and we see what we can make it do. And so this is, he uses that. And where did this go? So I guess you have some first set of googly eyes there, huh? Well, the googly eyes came from, uh, from, uh, what happened was we had a workshop that 
Haxter uh, sent us a bunch of these things at. So uh, we built a bunch of those things. And um, where did it all go? Oh, it's just Chrome. So uh, this is the programming for the robot. We got some lots going on. Well, it's Scratch, but this is the Google version. It's called Blockly, and it's from MakeCode.org. And um, if you look uh, Control Plus, you can see where uh, it's coming from, MakeCode.org, and it's got an Adafruit branded kind of thing on that deal. And um, and so basically, we put it together, and I said, I don't know if this thing is going to work or not, and uh, we loaded it up. And so what you're about to see is the results of said efforts. So let me plug in my 12-volt uh, battery because I've got a lot of these buck converters hanging around. And then uh, luckily this Cricut has an on and off thing on it. So you can see googly eyes. Now I'm going to tell you this thing is going to self-destruct really fast. But it is moving completely on its own. And I did promise this is the guy that did this was Jim from Canada. And I did promise him on the next uh, four corner, four square, the four corner thing that I will enter this robot on his behalf because it's going to do nothing but go straight and turn right. Okay. You know, but right now, all it can really do is uh, spin, spin right for a second and then spin left for a second and doesn't even do that very well. So I'm going to turn it on. It goes blue when it's ready, and then now it goes green and red, depending on which way it's doing. And that's pretty much what it does right there. And uh, before it runs off the thing, off my desktop, because that's what we got coded up to do. And uh, I don't know if that gets me a gold star or not, but it's a robot. It didn't move under its own power. Yeah. You get you a gold star. And uh, the idea is that this is a circuit. This this actually thing right here is just neat as all get out. If you've not seen one of these circuit playground expresses, it's got like uh, 10, uh, 10 RGBs on it. It's got a little bit of motion detection on it. It's got a little bit of speaker, a little bit of uh, a little bit of microphone. Um, it can be touch capacitive, and it uses the mounting bolts right here. To connect up your SCI, your I2C stuff, and your power on it. And on this, you have a motor controller. You've got a Neo Pixel controller already built into the board for it. Um, it's got a speaker so we can make it louder. A bunch of uh, the, the I.O. you can plug into and uh, some servo drivers. So it's got all that in this little board and I just bolted it onto the thing. And... Um, I thought it was a I thought it was a pretty neat deal, and one of the things I think I can do here, if I he's talking about wanting to control it uh, with like Bluetooth or something, um, Adafruit has a Bluetooth uh, uh, application for your phone that I would use on that briefcase. Um, that I believe we changed one of these out to the Blue Fruit model, which has Bluetooth built onto the thing. Now we can turn this into do the same thing, use the Blockly code we have. And code it up to listen to the Bluetooth thing and listen to the reactive channels and stuff and do all that kind of stuff. So it's fairly straightforward and doing all the things. And I have a whole new set of wheels just for this guy with the low ride and the black uh, mag stuff. I just got to get a better way to connect them uh, than right now because these these wheels uh, uh, they blow. So uh, are, are you saying that's a, a separate board that the uh... yeah this is. That yeah, this is a separate board than that. Okay. So these are two separate boards. This is this this circuit playground express, which is right here. Um, it's been around for a while. I think these are all awesome little boards, especially if you want to uh, get somebody uh, into the Arduino and the IoT uh, going on here because it's got it's got lights, it's got sound, it's got sensors, it's got shape monitors, it's got all that stuff built in. It's even got an infrared uh, sending and receive on here. So if you wanted to make this a wearable, you have two or three of them. So if you, you know, you're shooting the LED uh, infrared at folks, and then uh, this would track it, and you can make it flashlights and do all kinds of stuff. Um, and it's it's really great. It's, yeah, programs, right? Programs like this, 
and and the and, and the cool part the really cool part of this the, the scratch folks uh, they're python based uh this is uh javascript based because if i want to get you know i want to go to big boy language so to speak i click that one button and now that's all the javascript of what i did so um it's pretty cool and i know there's misgivings about coding javascript on a better device i get you and i'll agree with you but i'm i'm just trying to get i'm just, as far as learning and and and, and getting a, uh, a, how can you say, you know, your first taste is free kind of thing into the whole thing, getting it going. For 29 bucks, that board's a heck of a deal with all hmm. the stuff that's got on it. Interesting. And uh, the cricket thing, the cricket, I think the cricket board over here, the one I had, when I'm showing you, this board right here is like 29 bucks. This board here is like uh, somewhere between 19 or 25 bucks. <laughs> On the thing, and I've had it. And of course, I got it free because I had a big order. I like when you spend six hundred dollars a year for it, they tend to give you a couple of things free on it on occasion. And um, and you say, wow, six hundred bucks, yeah, bunch of uh, seven hundred sixty eight LED. You saw the previews uh, uh, a few weeks ago, a month ago, or something. Yeah, that thing's actually uh, done and uh, got it in a contest being in it. But uh, so lots of fun stuff on here, and uh, the uh, the the blockly scratch even comes with modules already set up to know how to interface with all these different parts around the piece around the piece of it. so at the very least we're going to set this down on the four square and i'm going to do the go go forward x number of milliseconds turn right go forward and do that four times i figure it you know uh i saw some young man do it and he shamed me last time so this time i'll have something to uh, uh at least compete with him anyways you know that's the idea and I am tired as crap. And I just, that just amped me all up talking about that stuff. And now I can't go to sleep. Thank you, fellas. Thanks a lot. <laughs> all fired up. That's good. Hey, uh, Harold, so I don't, don't know if you've been looking at the Micro Center website, but they have a super cheap 3D printer, a Creality Ender 3D or 3 Pro. Uh huh. Ninety nine, ninety nine. Is it actually ninety nine, ninety nine? Do you need a coupon to get it down? Uh, well, no, it's, it's in the end. You gotta be a, you gotta be uh, a new uh, customer. I'll go right now. Yeah, look up the Ender, or sorry, the Crea Creality. Yeah. Pro. Uh, I think you gotta be a new customer though. I don't see any. Oh, you don't? Know? Any coupon? Okay, uh, cool. It's just, it's just in the ad. There it is. Can you see that? What? And they have more than twenty-five in stock. Wow, they yeah. really must be dumping those things hard. Yeah. Hey, I'm wondering if you can, um, you could reserve it. Can you reserve that, Ray? I don't know. Um, you could try to. You know, no, no, it says it's unavailable, unavailable online, online, so I guess yeah. yeah, that's a biased yeah. old price. What I, what I just did get from there not too long ago was a, a Ender 3 uh, V2, uh, and it was a it was a complete refurb, and I got it for 160 bucks. So yep. I, I, I appreciate the $99 version there, and that's actually a decent printer. They just, yeah. have, they just have a brand new version of that thing out that they're pushing. And um, that's good to know. I've sent some people at it for well, hell, I should just go buy one for ninety nine bucks. I, I own two of those uh, Creality's, a large one, a, t a ten, and a three. Yeah. And I, I'm really impressed with them things, as cheap as they are. You get you get, really a, you get a control board that you can do things with. You get four uh, stepper motors. You know, you got a twenty, you get a uh, twelve or twelve volt LED style power supply with the thing. You know, you get some extra rails and T-slots and stuff. I think if you had to buy all that stuff separate, you'd spend way more than 100 bucks. Yeah. If you're, yeah, yeah. Anyway. A glass and a heated bed. You know, Ray, man, I, I see here's a, there's a reason I, I missed last week here. No, it's really because I was at a 3D printing club on the thing. But I hang out. I, I love hanging out with folks that make me want to go buy stuff. It's awesome. <laughs> so... 
So speaking of the fact that you weren't here last week, I'm getting it cold for some reason, but um, let me show you something here because it's definitely up your alley. That could, that could be one of the Black Friday sales, you know how they're trying to move back Black Friday back to July, I think. Yeah, did the time day just go off as well? I mean, the, so, like, the time or something like that? So I don't know how oh, your right. self might have been, yeah. So I don't know how your self uh, balance and robots going, but on this rev site, this guy has a article on self balance and robots, pretty good. And then last week we had talked about uh, the tank robot, and it also has Cassin. So if you're into molding of rubber. He has that video too. So they're all three pretty good videos. So he's making his own tracks, huh? Yeah. So yeah, this is pretty interesting on the track. I see it like this concept better though, where he, you know, he did that with that rubber. He used timing belts, together. yeah. Right, the timing belt. I see it of the two paths, that's better, but. But for Harold, especially, he may want to look at this self balancing video. Probably talks very much in detail about how to balance. So that's one thing. And then the other thing I found interesting was. That they're um, seemingly like doing it uh, instructables. So you see, occasionally I did look elsewhere. <laughs> but on instructable, they're seemingly doing some contests with Tinkercad. And so this guy sort of refurbished that Chia thing. But the key is that you know goes into finer detail about uh, Tinkercad. So. As you can see here. So uh, that's the other thing I found. And then let's see what else. Kind of makes me wonder is it a place safe to play uh, videos made in Russia? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's, laughs> I must apologize. I was, I found the link, John, that you were showing, and I, um, I, I just pasted in the chat, but right. along the way it started auto playing, and it. it I, wasn't I was very wondering, thick, but yeah, it has. Loose accent. But it has good information. Ah. So, so anyway, <laughs> so there's those two things, and then the other thing is yes, printing of the reels. So, <laughs> Michael, you can print the reel. <laughs> Which is oh, is that uh, Ninja Flex or something? No, it's pretty solid. Oh. But hey, it does. I don't care that it bounces. I'm not on it, so <laughs> it was my attitude about that. So you know, it doesn't need that much shock. <laughs> so, so anyway, those are the three things. Yeah, just just as long as it doesn't vibrate so much that it starts, you know, losing nuts and bolts are falling out. You know, <laughs> like yeah. a built-in vibe test. Who needs a shaker table to stress test yeah. the robot when you just run it? Just use cog wheels. You, know. you just don't go that fast. It's the secret, right? <laughs> so, yes, Harold. So, how is the balance and robot coming along? Or have you? Well, that um, I got uh, I got taken away because my code launch people, um, which is coming to Dallas here next month, uh, and wanted to. Uh, you know, had wanted me to build something cool for them, and I think I did. Um, and so that got that got scrolled away. And then the next thing came up. This the, the little thing that you just saw me. Guy goes, "Hey, I got fifty thousand. Can we build things?" I go, "Here, let me think of what I got laying around." And I scrounged all the stuff that I had laying around. And he goes, "Oh, that'd be cool." And so we did that. So the balance pod, um, which uh, is indeed. Right here. Come on. 
there. There and there. Uh, we'll be uh, front and center tomorrow night to figure out what the heck's going on. And that's that's our that's the plan. And we'll see how far we get. We'll pick up where we left off, which is understanding um, uh, the different bit libraries that we could use and how yeah. do we integrate them and not use ten year old code, even though that code is probably perfectly fine and works great. Um, wow. and, you know, I I, I got to believe there's there's easier ways because they got the code I've looked at looks like we're doing a lot of bit shifting all over the place and that kind of stuff. And there's and I know that's happening under the cover uh, when we're dealing with these libraries, but I would like to be able to show some of the folks working here that there's, there's you don't have to necessarily understand all that to be able to do this and actually use these libraries. Well, so look at that video because I said it describes it pretty good about balancing that. And then last week, the other one, uh, or the week before, actually the week before last, there was another one which I'll pull up real fast that you might be interested in. All right. Do we have a uh, a URL for that? Carl, if you've got that somewhere, could you, you already put it in the chat? Is that the uh, correct the product you I'm trying to keep up, but I'm... I yeah, know, that's all right. I, I will, I will re-watch this video when it gets posted up, and I'll go grab, I'll go grab that URL. Well, let me... Post it in the uh, chat, that'd be great. Okay. I did put the URL for yeah. I put the URL for Trash Robotics, the Russian. Right. Stuff. Yeah, and the video is hiding into that uh, playlist. Yeah. No, no, I'm scared. I'm, I'm scared, man. Carl, I'm scared. That's... It's in there somewhere. Yeah. Good for bridges. So I, I did. Um, if you go to uh, Instructables.com and click on the contest and scroll down to where it says Micro. Controller contest, and you click on that. If you'll look in about the top ten entries, because that's when I put it in. They, it's just a first in, uh, you know. It's just a big old queue they put them in. Happened to do it just in the last couple of days before they fired it up. I think I'm like ten or twelfth in the list for if you want to see the proof case and all the building thing that's goes on there. And the uh, there's a little short video in there at the end of that about how that works too. If you want to go see that. I did, and I even checked that the refrigerator, literally the refrigerator light goes off when you close the lid. So I put a camera in the middle of it, video to make sure it works. And if you don't uh, want Russian, but this is the other one, and I'll show that briefly to you. That, well, I think two weeks back, uh, where is that picture? Ah, oh, there we are. That, and this is the other one, but this guy, Really, he describes just balancing without robot per se. But so you might like this one too, because yeah, his is just a rail that he's balancing. But he just talks about the program behind that. Yeah, the principle is essentially the same, right? Just right. The inverse movements and sorts of things. So this is the other one. Uh, you might want to look at. Ooh. Oh, I found the link for the uh, balancing robot, trash robotics, and put it in. So those are the two, yeah, links that regard to balancing on products as quickly as your idea. <laughs> okay, cool. Awesome, 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 awesome. Thanks, John. Uh, I think Pat, you had a follow-up question to raise uh, stuff and uh, I2C. That's two follow-up questions. Two follow-up things. So one was on I2C a couple weeks ago. The, the first one was Ray with his color sensor, and I will present my screen. Basically, Ooh. can everybody see that? Yes. That looks lovely. <laughs> oh, so that's God, called a nightmare. Ball over here. <laughs> so you notice the orange close to the ground. Yes. So, so that's one of the things I'd be fighting with Robo Columbus. Um, 
aside from if I did it in November, the chances of this of snow. So, um, on the plus side, as of today, I believe a lot of the oranges started to turn brown, but it's still there. So I just wanted to bring that up and see. Do you guys have that problem out in Texas? Fall lasts one day. Yeah. <laughs> it, green, brown on the ground. So yeah, but it doesn't last long. If you're lucky, one day. I, yeah. I, I have a picture when Debbie and I got married that Debbie and her and her bridesmaids uh, took a picture of this tree, and it was a lovely shade of. Uh, orange, red, that kind of stuff, nice fall colors. And on the day of our wedding, the very next day, it was leafless. Literally, the whole tree, plop, on the ground, gone. Yeah. That's normal out here for this time of year. For a month. Yeah. Two months. For, for a couple of weeks. At least, yeah. Beautiful. So, at least a couple of weeks. I don't, I don't know if it's the kind of grass that we have in the fields out here, but it uh, the tops of it turn kind of a brownish orange when they go to seed and it's everywhere so it's like the latest scans that I did I can barely see a peak and in some cases the peak is actually the orange from vegetation so it's it was really disappointing worked great when it was you know the grass was you know had gotten lots of water and it was really you know, a deep green and the orange yeah. cone was out there all by itself. And, but yeah, so that's sort of what I've been, what I'm fighting with uh, this time of year, trying to do uh, uh, Robo Columbus. Yep. I'm not saying I'm giving up on it. I just may try to push it a little farther into the fall. Some of those leaves will stay that orange -y color and and stay on the leaves till after the snow comes. Oh. So. Yes. I was wondering if the snow would uh, like, you know, knock some of the leaves off the trees or something, but it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> it does, but like uh, oak leaves, for instance, a lot of them will stay on the tree until the following spring and they'll fall off. Mm. And, you know, that sort of thing. But I'm more worried about the, you know, the little willow brush bushes and stuff like that that are low to the ground and they tend to turn that orangish red color. So the other one I had is uh, on the TPRG list last week, I posted uh, some I2C uh, links on troubles with uh, specifically the, uh, the one we were talking about with PNO55 and the Raspberry Pi with its inability to do uh, clock pulse stretching. And so I attempted to paste the links in somewhat out of sequence. And, but I, I did manage to, I believe, to get everything in. But um, it was uh, pretty good so far. I so here's one of the links I sent. And it goes into a couple solution workarounds on uh, doing it. But the one I found interesting was uh, creating a software I2C bus on the Raspberry Pi. And I did that. If I can get the PC. Uh, so basically, in, if I go to the standard bus, which is, is it bus zero or bus one, I've got nothing there. No bus zero. And if I go to bus three, which is the one software one, you can see the BNO is sitting there at 28. Yeah, that look, I read that, uh, Pat. So you, you didn't shoot it out into a vacuum. I actually did read that. And I, to be quite honest, I agree with you. I think that that's a very interesting solution. One, and they made it look. I didn't actually try it, but it made they made it look like it would be very easy to do. All you had to do was like one line of code. Yeah, it was pretty easy to do. And then uh, there was um, there was an Instructables I found as well that goes a little more in depth into uh, how you can set it up and you can set up multiple 
PPIO part mm. uh, and how it does it with some example Python programs using that. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that was that was interesting that uh, there's a possibility. Um, Since uh, you're there, can you put those links in the in the chat so that everybody has them in case yeah, they didn't get didn't get on the list? I can do that. Right now, how's that? Perfect. And that that's all I had. I just wanted to uh, clarify my somewhat. I didn't that. I didn't over there. I see it. Cool. No, I just wanted to clarify that up. Hey, thanks. Very cool. No. All right, are there any more uh, robot-y focused items? Because I have some, let's say, tangential things to share, but. Okay, uh, until any more robot-y things coming up, this will be, so my first segue is a shout out and a thank you to Kareem. And you'll see why in just a moment. Um, so I didn't get to work on robots, but I found these links that are either related to robots or um, anyhow, somehow. So the first of these countermeasure pants for six can a Robo Columbus. And uh, Kareem, I think this is an awesome find. So thanks. I'm just wondering if maybe we ought to uh, have a new award called the Orange Star. I'm not sure what we would like. Maybe the best use of countermeasures during a competition. I don't know. Baby. Maybe something like that. <laughs> yep. I've been hunting for those for years. <laughs> <laughs> I would wear them, but I'm not going to be there. So I thought we would take them. Bell bottoms and everything, baby. Oh, yes. <laughs> I just don't know what to say, Kareem. That just. Dude, that... Kareem, you'd be dead sexy in those pants. I don't know if I could be in the same room with that and contain myself. I'll tell you that now. As the human resources person once said at Texas Instruments, that's enough to raise your socks, roll your socks up and down. So, okay, the, the next one is a uh, accelerometer kind of a topic. And, you know, we're always using these accelerometers. And uh, so it was very interesting to me to see this that surfaced when it turns out that apparently oh. people were taking new iPhones on the roller coasters. And it's calling 911 because they're so violent. It thinks that they've had a hard fall. So, okay. <laughs> so, an accelerometer alert. So, that was a good one. Okay, the next one, I just have a few of these. And this, uh, you know, there's no point to this. It's just caught my eye, and I thought you might enjoy it. Trying to waste too much time. The next one is, um, you know, we're always worried about the next biggest Raspberry Pi 5 or whatever. Well, check out this guy. 9,408 Cray nodes each has 64 core CPU with 500 gig of DDR4. <laughs> so 8 million GPU cores and 4.6 petabytes. Uh, I don't even, I just, and what, what's the beauty of it? This is counter to uh, Dave Ackley's Keep It Simple Stupid because it runs and has a hardware fail every day. Every few hours it fails. So, uh, but that just, I thought that was crazy. <laughs> now, the mean time to failure is uh, shorter than the mean time to repair. <laughs> it could very well be. It could very well be. And the next one is, I, I haven't read this article yet, but at least it's Did skimmed you stop it. and start Maybe. it again? Sorry. Sorry. Um, is it sharing? Come on. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Come on. Come on. There we go. So there was this um, wireless haptic communication system. So there was some kind of discussion of uh, this recent chess tournament and how, um, you know, some assistant would convey the chess moves to somebody with a sensor um, on his person. And Adafruit thought it was so amusing that they have a whole write up that I'll uh, not repeat here on this video, but you're welcome to peruse it at your leisure it's kind of amusing okay and then the next one That's the beads thing. uh 
Yeah, we won't say where the sensor, the, the transducer was placed, but the sun never shines, I think. And in, in Pennsylvania, we had locks, right? If you needed to move a boat from one river to another, we had locks. So Germany, they built a, a lift, a boat elevator. So this is kind of cool. You know, totally not robotics, I guess, but the engineering, it looks pretty neat. So that's fun. And then for the least robot -y thing in my list, um, this one right here, uh, it just seemed cool to me. So if you want to chop some wood, you need an ax like this. And what happens is that when you cast the ax down, the weight of the thing goes sideways and it just splits the wood off to the side. It's really cool. But uh, anyhow, for my totally now for something completely different moment, I'm done. That's it. Links for later. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember the link, but I saw a link come across my YouTube feed a couple of weeks ago, and I go, "Man, I got to show this to the to the DPRG people." And uh, apparently, Heineken makes a beer cooler thing that takes beer and will follow you around the pool. And it's Heineken branded. I'm like, can't, I don't know what's wrong with that. Well, I'm not a big fan of Heineken, but it doesn't really matter at this point. It's beer following you around the pool or following you around and it's gold. That's awesome. Where have we seen that? Where have we seen that before? Yeah. A cooler that moves around. Yeah, yeah, we that saw that. Cool. Oh, we yeah. saw that somewhere. Uh, <laughs> one of the things here, when you mentioned the lock where it uh, lifts up and down, they uh, have one of those as part of the um, Three Gorges Dam. In China? They have an elevator type lock. Mm. Okay, as part of that, uh, because that's faster than the uh, multiple stage lock. Uh, the other is the, there's the Falaker wheel lock. It, it consists of having a uh, two floating uh, things here that the, the boat floats in on this one. And then, and then you rotate the whole, take the whole thing around. A Ferris wheel for boats. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's cool. It's a F-A-L Kirk wheel. Falkirk wheel. Well, since we're talking about things like that, did you guys see the article about the that company, that startup company out west that uh, takes of satellite and spins it around to 5,000 miles per hour and then shoots it out. And uh, then when it gets up to its apex, I guess they have a little rocket motor that pushes it the last little bit. There's nothing, absolutely nothing that could go wrong with that much kinetic energy being shoved into that big mass. Absolutely yeah. nothing could go wrong there. <laughs> Yes, that's that, is a, that is a goofy looking thing, man. It looks like a, the, the biggest uh, metal uh, fan blower, old school metal, you know, air blower that you would use to do something but pointed up in the air. You ever seen it's, it's no acting thing? So yeah, that, I, I thought that that's what I it looked like to me, too, Harold. But uh, uh, you gotta admit, they, they think big. I mean. I think it's about four or five stories, isn't it? Huh? Um, I don't know, remember exactly how big it is, but uh, I personally, uh, that scares me, but I would really like to be around and watch that thing fling a thing, you know, at least once. Yeah. The, the videos, the, the super high speed videos I've seen 
are pretty remarkable. I mean, you imagine that they got a kind of a vacuum in there and then they just opened the door at exactly the right time. <laughs> how, does, how does that happen? Is this a modern trebuchet? Basically, um, yeah, they, 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 yeah, that's what they kind of they call it a catapult. But, uh, and you know, the main thing they were trying to figure out is wh whether or not uh, the electronics could handle that uh, much acceleration. And, uh, but I mean, NASA was it was a NASA test, so it was kind of cool. I mean, somebody's taking them seriously somewhere, yeah. Yeah, I had an interview for uh, um, for Raytheon in Boston. Um, my wife was having a hard time getting a job here, and I was I had been working for Texas Instruments, and um, you know, so she thought maybe she could get a, a job somewhere in Massachusetts. So we went up there. Um, anyway, it was like a, a tank breaker kind of missile, you know, like a shoulder launch kind of thing. And this was in the, you know, there was no surface mount components. It was all through hole. But the first units that they did, they, you know, none of them were working. You know, they, they'd shoot them off and they, you know, just go ballistic. And, um, and when they, they took them apart, uh, yeah, basically it would shear the, the molded plastic piece, you know, from its legs, you know, or the, or the pins and, all of the, you know, the electronics would be in the back end of the compartment where the electronics were. And uh, so, yeah, they, they found they had to epoxy basically the whole thing to keep all the pieces in place. So probably a similar shock, you know, the. Well, is there shock or just G? Cause um, I mean, I would, I would guess that the, the whole point of this is to avoid uh, high, uh, uh, spectral content shocks and I mean so you might have a high g-force while it slowly ramps up to speed and then depending on the diameter of that thing it it probably has some pretty high linear velocity by the time it leaves but yeah I don't know I think it was more shock because the, you know there was like you know a, the thing is kind of like a big bullet you know it's there's an explosion that pearls it out of the well out of the launchers a lot of the other ones are rockets and i think the rocket ones have a softer launch but uh, doesn't have a time door does a thin foil cover hmm. wow thin, yeah but you figure um okay so let's talk about uh, talk about shocks and electronics what's always wondered make me wonder is um like these these missiles that have detonators that trigger after the missile penetrates the armored shell of a tank or a bunker, <laughs> the feet of concrete for a concrete bunker. I mean, it's, how does that happen? How do you? <laughs> well, I was I was watching. Uh, some, there's some documentary, uh, something tanks on like Netflix or one of those uh, things going on. They were showing how some of these shells work. That some of them don't don't trigger after some of them trigger right when it hits because it melts it melts uh it basically melts the this copper casing core into nothing that still has most of the kinetic energy so you have this molten metal ripping through the uh as soon as it hits you have the molten metal drilling through the uh the the, the armor of the tank and then whatever's on the inside of that gets splattered with however many degrees molten copper is. And you're pretty much, you know, something's toast. So I know some of them work that way because I just saw at least that's what they said. But I've got no idea how to do that uh, punch at something because like the M M1 Abrams tank, it has that reactive armor where if it senses something close, it blows up this way so it doesn't get close, right? And and, and, and in, some, in some of the armor, you know, it, it's got to hit through several different layers of that kind of defense before it even gets into the thing. So, man, I, I don't know. I don't know how they do that. Well, I think the, the thing is, is that the basic shape charge with a copper lining on it uh, gives you that effect. In other words, it, it's, it melts the thing and it shapes it and forces it all together. Yeah. In one one thing, it's not multiple charges. Hmm. 
Okay, guys. Uh, all right, so we've had a robot stuff, and we've had some detours. Um, Have we degenerated to ground zero? Well, I, I just wanted to put that out there as an option, as a uh, like a going once, going twice kind of thing. So uh, what do we think? Any other diversions for the night? Doug has something, or at least no. he's got the... Bye-bye. Um, <laughs> he doesn't have anything else. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Well, with that, have a great night. Going twice, three times. We'll see you next Tuesday. Two gold stars tonight and an orange star. We'll figure that out later and catch you, catch you in November. Awesome. All right.